Welcome to the uh, third summer LAA flat test lecture, and welcome to, to Western. Um, as you know, the flat test courses that we're organising uh, organised in order to uh, fill a bit of a gap that we've got coming up with um, uh, ageing test pilots. We're doing our best to age the ones that we've got on our course, but uh, <laughs> I think we're setting ourselves up better for the um, future with uh, um, the uh, students that we've brought through our courses. This is actually the fifth course that we're running at the moment. So far, amazingly enough, out of the five courses that we've run, we haven't lost a single day due to weather. So that's quite remarkable. So, about a fortnight ago, I realised that we had to organise this lecture, and we haven't got a lecturer organised. So I rang up Tom and said that he was lucky he'd been selected. <laughs> <laughs> Story of my life. Bad news was he was to, to give this talk. But, uh, Tom has tremendous experience of flight testing, particularly in microlights and uh, in our end of aviation including some rather interesting spinning work, which I'm sure we're going to hear about. So um, I ask you all to welcome Tom in the usual way. Thanks, Francis. Oh, is that all right? Yeah. Yeah, I can hear, yeah, I can hear the feedback. <laughs> um, I, some years ago, I learned very quickly when giving a talk, it's not a lecture, it's a talk, uh, to an audience that you really should know your audience when you begin to prattle on. I was giving a talk to, um, to a group of businessmen up in Aberdeen on flying back and forward to the oil rigs and telling them all about what we're up to. And uh, at one point it became clear I had to explain to them how a helicopter actually flew. And not knowing exactly who was all in the audience, I asked if anyone had experience of helicopters. And nobody said anything, so I did the simple thing of telling them all about how helicopters flew with a rotary wing and the big arrow going up and it moved about as you move things. Finished the, the talk, asked for questions, and a bastard, not a bastard, um, a guy in the back. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, raised his hand and said, I'm the chief design engineer of Bristol Helicopters and I have a question. <laughs> he got a response which meant he didn't ask any more questions. <laughs> Anyway, I've called this basic flight testing. Uh, the BMA do not have any, to my knowledge, uh, trained test pilots having gone to test pilot school, and most of them have come up through the system of learning what they have to do on the job. Now, I left the RAF after uh, 20 years nearly, and I had never had any inclination of becoming a test pilot, uh, nor did any of my bosses want to recommend me, which is just as well because I don't think I would have had the academics to get it through. In fact, I was particularly bad at mathematics, and when I was training at Cranwell, uh, at the end of the first year, which was the academic year, I was very worried because my ground school results were uh, not very good in the mathematics department. I got 21%. So I thought, that's the end of a beautiful friendship, and went to see my tutor. I, th I thought to negotiate my way out of the Air Force. But when I went in, he said to me, have you seen the results? I said, yes, sir. He said, 21%. Well done, Porches. Better than expected. <laughs> <laughs> My friend uh, Ewan Kiwi Perot was the chap I beat. He was on the bottom. He got 20%. It didn't do him any harm. He went on to fly fast jets and eventually became a red arrow. Right, how do I do this thing? I don't know if you can see this. This is taken from a newspaper. I joined the British Airways helicopters and after two years became a, what they called flight technical officer. His job was to liaise between pilots and the engineering department on any modifications or any procedures that we wanted to introduce. And the first job that I got to do really was to participate in checking to see that this helicopter, which started out life as an S61R, which had a fixed undercarriage, and we modified it to be an N as an amphibian. We wanted to make sure after we'd done all the normal testing after heavy maintenance that, first of all, it would float, not sink, and not carry on too much water. So the way we did this was to take the aircraft into the hover over a lake near the, the base we were using, which is Bournemouth, and in the hover, we checked to see how much power we were pulling, put it on the water, taxied around a bit for about 10 or 15 minutes, 
picked it up to haul her to see how much power we're pulling. If we're still happy, put it on the water and do the same thing until we finish the required amount of time. And then took it back to the engineering department and they all clustered around, very pleased to see it was back, although wet at the bottom. And uh, I watched as they pulled the plugs out of the uh, sponsons and the main part of the fuselage. And I was amazed to find how much water poured out of it. And all the engineers looked at us, moved away from the puddles, and then looked at each other and said, well, that seems all right. <laughs> Put the plugs in, and then they certified it. <laughs> now, this aircraft, the S61N, um, required to have uh, a sea anchor part of, of its uh, entourage. The, when you shut down an, an aircraft like this on the ground, the uh, torque which is generated as you shut the engines off and put on the rotor brake, um, the torque goes through the, the rubber uh, wheels and the aircraft, although it wobbles a little bit, there's no tendency for it to roll over. On the water, on the other hand, there's no friction to hold it from moving around much more and possibly falling over. So it came out of the can, as it were, with a sea anchor. The sea anchor was designed to be launched from inside the cockpit by the co-pilot who attached it to a rope that was at the front and he would throw it out and uh, it was like a parachute, the ripcord would come out, uh, the canopy would billow out and under the water and you get a gentle tug as you knew that the thing had pulled up. Now that seems a fairly simple sort of way of doing things, um, but there's a weak point and that is the co-pilot has got to remember to attach it to the aircraft. <laughs> and one night, when we still had this old system, two of our senior pilots, uh, I'm glad to see we have Royal Naval representation here, because these two senior pilots were ex fleet on, and uh, they were called out at night to take some essential cargo to an offshore installation, and on the way back, empty aircraft, just the two of them, we had a problem requiring them to land on the water. They were fairly close to shore, uh, and they were told that the life raft was on the way, so they were set about shutting down the rotor. So the captain said to the co-pilot, launch the sea anchor, so he took it out and threw it out the window. <laughs> that was it. They then were faced with the, the problem of shutting it down. In fact, it was a very calm uh, sea, and uh, they just let the rotor coast quietly to a stop, so it didn't roll over. However, that caused us to need to make um, um, an adjustment. There we are. Um, this is the same aircraft uh, when we're preparing to do something completely different with it. Uh, but uh, if you can, I don't know if you can see, but just here is the, the rope to which uh, the sea anchor will be attached. The sea anchor is not this big black thing, that's the radar thing. You can't see where the attachment is, but the engineers came up with the idea that the thing should be as automatically launched as possible. So they fitted a box outside in which the sea anchor, which is like a parachute about a uh, foot square, would sit already tied up to the aircraft so that when the, it needed to be launched, there was a three actions required to launch it. We were desperately keen not to have the thing launch in flight because a large parachute coming out tied to the front of the helicopter would uh, not have been pleasant. So three actions. We had a, 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 a pull pin out, press down on a, a button and pull a lever. And that would release the lid off the box and the spring-loaded base of the box would spit the, um, the anchor out, and as it fell, the rip cord would come out, fall in the water, and uh, float in front of us. Well, that was the idea, and in fact, it actually worked. We uh, decided to do it uh, on inshore water to start off with. Uh, we did actually do a second flight out at sea, and we, it worked just as well out at sea. But we decided to do it on the river Adur, near Shoreham, next door to Shoreham. So because we didn't Although we had flown the aircraft and made sure that we could do as much as we needed to do in the air, and we still couldn't dislodge the, the cover off the sea anchor, uh, we still flew down to Shoreham with it disconnected, landed on, connected it up, and we had the engineer who designed this equipment to fly in the back. And we didn't, and never intended this aircraft to operate from the water by shutting down its rotors because there was no way of retrieving the sea anchor and then fly away again. So we had to do it for the one-off test that we did. And the design engineer decided that the way to do it was to have some form of rope system so he could deflate the, the canopy and retrieve the whole thing when, it, when we finished the test. 
So we flew down to Shoreham, checked in with air traffic control, got the device all wired up, checked that our line of defense, in case we couldn't retrieve the, uh, the, the, the anchor, which was the Royal National Lifeboat Institute's inshore lifeboat man, uh, was actually on call, and he was, and he checked in with the air trafficker. So we're happy with everything working, we thought, we hopped over the hedge, put it on the water, and when everything was ready, we did a countdown and launched it, and it worked exactly as advertised. So many congratulations all around, a great green engineer in the back thinking that everything was hunky-dory. So we said, right, deflate the anchor and bring it in. And he pulled and pulled and pulled, and he couldn't get the thing to move, so he said, sorry, it was stuck. So we thought, right, call out the lifeboat man. It was a weekend, and uh, the lifeboat man was called, and he acknowledged the fact that he'd been called, and uh, we waited for his arrival. And we checked with air traffic control again. Yes, he's been, he'd be there with you shortly. So we waited until we got fed up, and then we said, well, what can we do about this if, he'd, if he's lost or sunk? So we decided that the co-pilot, being a, an athletic chap, should try to get his arms out of the side of the aircraft, uh, up, this thing? up here, and lean down to try to get the rope. We maneuvered so that the rope was coming past the, the, this end, uh, but he still couldn't reach it. And even when he was had his whole of his upper body with his backside sticking up in the air outside the the, um, the, the, the window, which we'd had to jettison to get him out there, engineer hanging onto his legs didn't work. So we thought, right, next thing to do is to maneuver this rope around here where the cargo door was and get the engineer to lean out and try to retrieve it. But before we got round to that, and I don't know why we didn't do it to start off with, he said, ah, we've deflated it, we've brought it on board, everything's okay. So that was fine. Cleared up inside, lifted off, popped back onto a showroom to put everything away again. As I said, it was a weekend and there were a lot of people around, so they all came to have a look and we did our liaison thing, explained to them what we were doing and what helicopters did. I didn't check to see if the Bristol chief engineer was still around, but uh, anyway, I was quite happy. And we suddenly noticed at the back of the crowd was a chap in a, a sailor's uh, sweater with RNLI written over it. So I sidled up to him and said, well, was he the uh, indoor inshore uh, lifeboat man? He said, yes, he was. Had he got the call? Yes, he had. Why didn't he come out? He said, well, I was having lunch in the pub across the river. He said, I saw it, you were all right, not in imminent danger, so I decided to finish my pint. <laughs> they, they did not get a donation from us that particular day. So we got the, the system up and running. Um, oh. As I said, I'd started off with British Airways after two years being the flight technical officer uh, on the S-61. We had a couple of S-58s, which are vaguely Wessex lookalikes, but we disposed of them fairly shortly. And as British Airways helicopters were beginning to expand, uh, they got hold of S-76 aircraft, Puma aircraft, Westland 30, and Boeing Vertol 234 uh, civilian Chinook. Now, that was obviously too much work for one FTO, because I still had to do a, some line flying as well. So we saw, instantly saw the, the ability to expand the empire. So we got a technical pilot for each of the types, and the FTO became the chief pilot technical services. At about that time, CAA began to let us know that as British Airways helicopters had a design authority, they needed certain positions to be filled by appropriately qualified people and one of these was the chief uh, test pilot and that fell into my bailiwick as well and I, I was called that although I never did anything about it. It's quite a different beast from a chief test pilot in the military. Um, it's, a lot of it is administrative stuff apart from being able to do flight testing. You have to make sure that any pilots assigned to test flights are suitable that the flight test reports were adequate or satisfactory, and that any airfields that were used were up to speed. Mm -hmm. 
I left British Airways Helicopters after about 10 years, did a bit of time as a consultant, mainly with a Bond Helicopter as one of their uh, uh, test pilots. I came away from flying and British Gas Aviation Advisor. Uh, so I began looking for uh, a way to keep me airborne and started microlighting. I fairly soon got into instructing and microlighting. And because of my military background, where I'd been a basic flying instructor, I'd done a lot of spinning. Uh, one of my st ex-students is actually proving the point that it was quite satisfactory. <laughs> um, the uh, BMA asked if I would become a, one of their test pilots, and so I did, and we began to get involved in spin testing of aircraft which had been approved by the CA to go from 390 kilograms maximal of weight to 450. Come on in. This is the first aircraft that we spin tested. It's called an X-Air. Um, because we had so little spinning experience in the BMAA, I started out doing it with a, another test pilot in the aircraft. And uh, then the next week we did another test pilot and gradually cascaded down a little bit of experience for people. We also did the thruster. Now, don't be alarmed by the, the floats. We didn't, we hadn't yet spun the thruster float plane, though we did spin other float planes. But what I want you to see is the openness of the rear part of the, of the fuselage here. That is the fuel tank. We stuck, stuck a um, ballistic recovery system on that, BRS. And with the openness of the rear cockpit, there was no problem to projectile clearing the aircraft if we needed to because we're very concerned that if we got into a spin, we might not be able to get out of it. So the BRS system was there for our safety. We also then moved on from the thruster T600, that was called, uh, even without the floats, and the thruster sprint took a modification to fill in the rear part of the fuselage. So when we came to the spin testing of that, uh, the question was, how do we make sure that the projectile, if it's fired, goes clear of the aircraft? Fortunately, I had two large windows, plexiglass windows at the side. And we removed the right-hand one and covered it in brown paper, and we were pretty sure that the projectile would get through that. We got on to uh, certifying this aircraft, which is called the Sky Raider 2. It's an American aeroplane, kit aeroplane, and <coughs> one of the companies here brought it across, and there were three test pilots involved in and testing that. Uh, two BMA test pilots and one CAA test pilot. We um, got as far as trying to do the spinning, and my part of the spin program was a single-seat aircraft. My part in the spin program was to uh, get it airborne and with a forward center of gravity and see if you could spin it. Found it couldn't be spun, at, or I couldn't spin it at forward center of gravity, and it, the rest of the program was taken over, I think, by CAA test pilot. Uh, Oh, you don't remember, do you? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you <do>. Very well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there was a problem with the owner's copyright of the name of the Sky Raider, so we changed it to get out of the legal wrangle, and it became uh, an Easy Raider. And that's what the Easy Raider became. That was that had a full spin program. Didn't need any additional. And test pilots by that stage, and uh, I think I did all of them, or most of them anyway. And its big brother was the Escapade. I'm sorry about the expansion of this. It started out life as a, a normal photograph, but uh, it became like this when I put it onto my disc. It's a two-seater, uh, people sitting side by side, and the, the folks who had bought the Easy Raider had expressed, or were interested in the Easy Raider, had expressed the interest in a two-seater two side by side, both controls. We also did the Slovakian aircraft, the uh, Dynamic. Uh, we started off with an exploratory program, and I'll come on to that later. And uh, we also did the Escapade version of the VLA, which became an LAA aircraft. Now, one of the things that uh, it's quite easy to do is if you're about to fly a brand new aeroplane, one that you haven't flown before, 
or, or, or as, as sketchy information about it. You can tell quite a lot just by looking at it uh, to try to identify where you might find some problems. And you want to find out any aerodynamic characteristics that uh, might be adverse or even good. So we'll get back to the Sky Raider. And looking at it now with a different eye, perhaps, you can see the fin is quite small. The whole tail is quite big, but the fin is quite small. And that might have given us a slight idea that we might have better directional uh, problems. And we were, we were right. We found that uh, we needed more rudder. And the way we did that, I was getting back to the sky. You see that the, the rudder has been extended down to here from down there and down to there. And that gave us some very good, uh, good, good stability. This is a full picture of the escapade. This is the uh, UK prototype. You can see that the, I hope you can see that the rudder is a bit bigger than the Easy Raiders, other uh, than the Sky Raiders, and it's got a very weird nose wheel, a very highly raked back, uh, non steerable uh, nose wheel. This aircraft actually can be either a nose wheel aircraft or a tail wheel aircraft and it can be a, a, a adjusted by the owner. You just jack it up, take that off, stick on the, a, not, that, not that one, but another tail wheel, and you move the undercarriage around and forward so it, the wheel is actually beneath the front of the, of the thing. Anyway, we also flew the prototype aircraft in the States, in Idaho, and I was very concerned about this uh, nose wheel and had a lot of trouble steering it. You required to use the brakes, and... Uh, my normal habit in flying and driving these aeroplanes around the ground was to put on full rudder whichever way I wanted to go and apply the brakes. A lot of the aircraft I'd flown had either a brake lever on the control column or chipmunks down the side of the cockpit, and it was dead easy to taxi these. But this was a, a, a tow brake, and I found if I did use full rudder, I had difficulty actually getting uh, my foot to use that brake. And in fact... Uh, I think I became the first and probably only pilot to ground loop one of these, and it's a secret, so please don't tell me. <laughs> Fortunately, we had the rest of the test crew tack driving behind me, and they picked me up after uh, falling off their taxiway, and we got started, and eventually got the thing airborne. But the technique, obviously, was not to use the rudders, because it was quite useless, uh, but to keep the rudders straight and use the brakes as, as required. Now, to go back a little bit, and but a related subject, this is a, taken about 10 years before. It's a JP-1, Jet Provost 1. Forget the grinning ape in the front. He was just finished his first solo in it. But the thing that I thought about here was, you see the very tall undercarriage. And the undercarriage wheels are very wide apart. And that immediately gives you the thought that it might be difficult to control on the ground, particularly as the nose wheel is non-steerable. And it was there that I began to pick up the idea of having the, the technique of uh, keeping the rudder straight. This is just to show you the, the lineage. That's a JP-1 in the background and the piston provost in the front. And that's three of them, all owned by the guy in the front, a rich American who had lots and lots of aeroplanes. Speak to him about them on it. And this is the other one he owned, which is JP-5. And you can see the difference there between the JP-1, much lower undercarriage, uh, much higher rake back on the, on the nose wheel, and less distance between. It was a delight to, to taxi that one. And this is just because of a nice picture I found as I was going through my pictures. JP-1 with a gnat belonging to the owner, and that gnat belonged to somebody else. He also had some hunters which he'd bought and renovated, uh, a wasp helicopter which he used to com commute sometimes between his near London home and Cranfield where he had his, his circus. He also had a chipmunk. So, to go back to some of the aircraft that we'd found had bad aerodynamic characteristics, we've already done that one to death. This is another picture of the Easy Raider, seeing the big... Um, <coughs> the big 
out of Rudder, not Rudder, Finn. And going back to the uh, dynamic, this one is actually a, a, a British registered one. Uh, the original trip we'd made was to let the owner of the company who was going to introduce them decide whether he wanted to go to the expense of getting all of his approvals from the CAA, getting the aircraft which was flying at about 550 or 600 kilograms down to 450. Uh, and this picture was actually docked by him because he was waiting for the CAA to Congrats. clear the aircraft. <laughs> yes. He didn't like that very much. Oh, sorry, go back. Uh, the aircraft looks lovely. It's a nice aeroplane to fly. Uh, sometime before we went out there, the BMAA had sent their chief technical officer across, and he had flown the aircraft, and he was very worried about the stalling characteristics. And it was made known to the CA that this was obviously a, a difficult area. And when we went out to do the assessment of this aircraft to see if the owner wanted to put his money into it, um, we spoke with the CAA and said, this is what we want to do, and if possible, we want to spin it at the end of our program, because these aircraft have never been spun. And the CAA said, we'll be very, very careful, because the, spin the stalling characteristics are so bad, and we agreed that if, we, if I decided that I was going to go ahead with the spin program out there, I would speak with the CAA before I, I joined. So, <coughs> I got airborne the first time with the demonstration pilot, and he was also a junior test pilot, and uh, he began to get a little bit agitated, or look agitated, as we got through the flying I was doing. And I said, well, now we're going to do some stalling. And uh, stalled the aircraft. And lo and behold, in an instant, we had a 90-degree wing drop. And I recovered immediately. If I'd held on to it, I don't know how far I would have gone. But I didn't want to hang around and do that. And I looked at him and said, is that normal? And he said, I don't know. We've never done it before. <laughs> so this is a bit confusing. So we uh, went back, had a, a chat with the, uh, the, the designer of the aerocraft, who was actually a big wheel on in Aerospool, the company. And he, he said, said to us, well, look at the video that we've taken off a tufted wing. And we looked at this video, and you can see all the tufts doing what they should do as you slow down, and then the aircraft accelerated away. But we noticed that it accelerated away at 65 kilometers an hour, which is the equivalent of 35 knots which is the requirement for a microlight. It mustn't <coughs> stall above that weight. It's got to stall below, above that uh, speed. So um, we said, how come this is? He said, well, in this country, we don't need to stall it. And this was very worrying because they also didn't need to spin it. But we went back a week later, a couple of weeks later, for a celebration party, which was celebrating 100 of these aircraft made and flying in Europe. They hadn't stalled properly, and they had not been spun. So... They realized that for the UK, they had to be able to uh, stall this airplane safely. So the designer said, what we must do is adjust the incidence at the, the wingtips. So they adjusted the angle or dangle of the ailerons. And so we went off and tried that again. It was a very slight improvement. We only got about 50 degrees wing drop. And it was quite a random. You go 50 degrees, 20 degrees, left and right wing. It was all... Well, not very pleasant and certainly not, uh, not regular. So we came back, he had another thing. He then fitted some vortex generators along the length of the leading edge of the ailerons on the wing in order to agitate the, the air going over the, uh, the ailerons. And tried that. Again, there wasn't much of an improvement at all. But the thing that did a big improvement was when we got these stall strips. And that made all the difference, just that a foot and a half or whatever, and we were getting nice, clean stalls without any hassle. Uh, final thing on this little section, talking about looking at aeroplanes and deciding if they are going to give us any hassle. This looks like a right old bag of nails. In fact, it was a very pleasant aeroplane to fly, and whatever you thought about it, looking at it, it was one of the aircraft that was used in most of the flying schools in the microlight world, and it had a lot of successful students in it. I want to talk about the cautious approach to high-risk testing. 
I regard high-risk testing in our type of airplanes uh, as being anything that would cause the air, any maneuver that would cause the aircraft to depart from safe flight. Stalling, obviously, in all of its guises, turning, climbing, descending, and spinning would be high risk. And you've got to take particular um, interest in that. Now, if you're going to start looking at a new aeroplane that hasn't been flown before, you must spend a lot of time studying it, that, how it looks, how to sit in it, all the books on it, make sure you understand the temperature and pressures, the air speeds that are required before you actually get airborne. BMA has a test pilot who is no, openly says that he will refuse to fly any new aeroplane until he's run out of excuses not to fly it. <laughs> That seems to be quite a good, uh, good mantra. I also knew of a test pilot who took into account the tastefulness or otherwise of the colour scheme. <laughs> and I, no, no, I, somebody else, uh, would sometimes try to refuse to fly such an aircraft and would go in disguise. <laughs> <laughs> now, the LAA also takes the same sort of view about the thoroughness of pre takeoff checks. And, uh, if you look at the VLA starting its pre takeoff checks, now this is about a fortnight before we actually want to fly it, so he wanted to make sure that we were, it, was, it was all right. He's looking for loose articles there, I think, and then he seemed to be quite happy and decided that he would go ahead. So, discussing as we are the uh, high-risk maneuvers, um, I was very impressed with the company that produced the dynamic in their professionalism and their adherence to safety uh, concerns, apart from the fact that they couldn't stall their aeroplane or spin it. But everything else about them was, uh, made, made you feel very good about it. This is the, the heavier aircraft, whilst we're still considering whether to invest in, in the... Uh, the microlight version, and um, we were looking to see if there were any showstoppers. Stalling had obviously been one to start off with, but we felt that we had got through that. The next problem was going to be, could it spin, and could we recover from it? So we got sat around the table, and we decided to set up our, our requirements for the spin testing. Uh, I have to say that before we committed to do spinning, I did call the uh, CAA test pilot to discuss it with him as we'd agreed. And it must have been a holiday we were on uh, in England because he answered his phone immediately and he'd been sitting on the Sussex Downs having a picnic with his family but still took time to have a chat with us about the spinning. And eventually he, he and I agreed that we would go ahead incrementally and see how we could spin this aircraft. Now, the requirements would be an anti-spin parachute. We'd also have a ballistic recovery system, which was going to be quite easy to do because there was one already existing in the heavier aeroplane. It was part of the equipment. It was built in during the build of the aeroplane. And I'll show you where it's held in the aircraft shortly. The canopy tilted forward to get into the aeroplane and out, and so it wasn't going to be easy to get out of that if you had a parachute on and wanted to jump over the side, so we made the, uh, the canopy jettisonable. And we also carried, I carried, a, wore a, a personal parachute and a hard helmet. The hard helmet wasn't a, a flying helmet, it was a parachutist helmet, which is smaller than the pilot ones that I had, but the canopy came down so low against your head that there was no space for you to have a, a full, head, full helmet there. Operating requirements were that the aircraft had to be clear of cloud for its uh, spin. Spins were to be initiated from at least 8,000 feet. In this country, flying something like an, an escapade or easy raider, we were quite happy to, um, to go from 5,000 feet above ground because we knew that if it wouldn't come out, we only had one option, and that was to jump out. And we jump out by 3,000 feet. We had three systems here, the anti-spin anti, anti chute, the uh, BRS and the ability to jump over the side. So we wanted to give ourselves as much height above uh, the 3,000 foot decision height as possible. 
We also, because of the situation, never having spun it before, agreed that we do the spins from overhead the airfield, and that had different uh, advantages and it kept us away from habitation. And if we crashed, there was easy access to the crash and rescue people. We decided to pursue the incremental approach, and so the aircraft is going to be spin tested at forward, central, and aft centers of gravity. In the olden days, when we were flying the X-Air and things, we used to advise people that if you're going to spin test, you would do a, an initial quarter turn entry to a spin and recover, and then you do a half spin entry and recover. But we thought, wait a minute, we're almost all the way around. We're going to have to stop the thing and roll it this way or keep it going or do a pull through, which might scare a lot of us. So we decided to do away with that, just do the quarter spin entry first, think about it, and if we're happy with that, proceed to the, the, the full uh, one turn and recovery. The one turn I refer to is a British requirement of these spin tests, and that is that the aircraft, if it can be spun, um, will spin will be able to be recovered after one turn of an erect spin or three-second turn, whichever is the greater. And the, um, the aircraft must be recoverable within one further turn of taking the actions. So if we're happy, we're going to do the full stuff. And after each flight, we landed on the airfield, which is just below us anyway, uh, for refueling and adjusting the balance for the next leg, and because we're videoing from the inside the, uh, the cockpit and also from outside uh, the aircraft, we took the videos out and we had a, a round table debrief after each flight so we would know that we're going in the right direction. And in fact, a positive thing came out of it because one of the engineers, the Slovak engineers, uh, pointed out that he didn't think that the, sp the spin took uh, as many as th three seconds. So then the next thing we did was do a one and a half turn. That he was quite happy with that. Here is the anti-spin parachute. And this bit here is the adjust uh, attachment for glider. So it's very easy to have the spin parachute here. You see the rip cord, and when the thing came out, it would dangle on the end of, of what is it? Was my thing? There we are. That there, and you could then release it if it brought everything out and fly home. We um, were offered the chance of flying over the airfield and popping this thing to see if it worked. And I decided that I would take their word for it, but could we try it on the ground first? And so they set it up so it had a lot of slipstream. They popped this, and it came out a dream and strung, uh, strung up behind us, behind the aircraft. Now, I know that in the spin... If this is the tail of the spin, the parachute would be dangled behind you as you went round. But the main thing is it's supposed to bring the nose down, which is prerequisite for recovery. So we're quite happy with that. The pilot sitting in with his mini hard hat, uh, his parachute, and his, his straps, of course. And this bit here is where the BRS sits, right in front of the co-pilot. The pilot sitting in the left-hand seat. And it's a frangible cover, so that uh, when you pull the thing, it'll break as the parachute comes out. And all the rest of the parachute is wrapped around the cockpit, so that the aircraft, with the BRS uh, open, should come down fairly level. I wasn't too concerned about the landing, uh, because the, the seat was very much like a glider seat. It, you were very well reclined. You couldn't sit upright, otherwise you'd bash your head anyway. Oh, and also we, you'll see we have mounted here the onboard video. Now, it was in an awkward position for me. I couldn't reach the on-off switch, and I'd probably forgotten to switch it on and off anyway. So we decided to leave it on for the, the duration of each flight. We could edit out the bits we didn't need, but keep the bits that we wanted. And I hope that when we finish that you see a couple of minutes of uh, the result of, of that. Here's the uh, cockpit from the inside, and you will notice that we are not about to fly, this is, we haven't set the QFE here, we set up a, a G meter for the testing, and uh, that's a vertical speed indicator, don't know what that is, artificial horizon, 
his speed indicator in kilometers per hour, and I don't know what that is either. Uh, this is the lever to release the uh, anti-spin parachute, and you can see the safety pin here. That's the BRS operating. We had other switches around to make sure we could op open the, the anti-spin parachute and then get rid of it if necessary. Uh, we also had somewhere around in the cockpit the uh, cockpit jet jettison handle, so if I decided to jump out rather than wait for the BRS to work, um, or even after it had gone and got scared, um, I'd be able to get rid of the canopy to jump. The other things of interest perhaps are the flap lever. I found it very, very difficult to pull that all the way back, and I'm not a shrinking pilot, as you would perhaps agree. So we, when we got it back to UK, we adjusted the gearing of that to make it much more easily usable. That is the trim lever, and under the hand is the, the foot brake. <coughs> This is the Zlin. I don't know what type of Zlin it is, but it's um, the one we used for the photo ship. And um, you're asking where the photographer is. Who do you think is taking the picture? The idea that we would fly directly over the airfield was a good one. But I had difficulty in seeing over the front of the wing because of this helmet and the closeness of the canopy. So it was agreed that Joseph, who's the who's the chief uh, test pilot of WARS, chief test pilot, um, he would tell us, because he'd be information with us, he would tell us when we could start the spin. But because he spoke no English and I spoke no uh, Slovak, he decided, or we decided, that he would operate by calling down to uh, Paolo, the guy who was a test pilot and demonstration pilot, and he would man the radio. So as soon as he got the word from on high, he would tell me it was ready, we were ready to go. Interested audience. Uh, the guy, the old guy in the back is, can't remember his name, but he was the designer of the aeroplane. He was 75 if he was a day, and uh, he did a lot of flying every day, towing gliders. And on one occasion when we were there, we saw him at lunchtime getting airborne in a glider, and he returned in the glider at 5 o'clock. He was a very skilled glider pilot. The other two guys in the back here are, CA, are Slovak CA engineers, and the fellow at the front is the managing director. So they're naturally interested in what was going on. As I said, I was very impressed with the professionalism of Aerospool. Here's a picture of them doing the weight and balance specifically for our, our spinning program. Digital weight. Uh, not at all like uh, I've seen uh, people using bathroom scales and all sorts of things out in the field. And I really don't know who this little boy is. He kept wandering in and out as people were looking at things. He'd always try to get into the cockpit with me at one stage, uh, but he might have spilled his Coca-Cola, so we decided not to let him do that. I said we had a, a crash rescue people. They didn't have a crash rescue team on the grass airfield there, but they did have a mine rescue team. And they brought them in. And they came in with... Uh, a lot of people, a lot of equipment, and an ambulance. And uh, we thought it was very appropriate that they were mine rescuers because if we were going to crash in front of them and dig a big hole, they could dig down to collect us. <laughs> we thought it was quite funny when we came up with the old joke about writing, dig here for Tom on the top of my helmet. <laughs> they weren't required, but they were good good work. So we did make sure that we were well briefed on the aeroplane before we started flying. So what did we learn from high-risk testing? <coughs> not only from the flying of the dynamic, but all the other ones. If a ballistic recovery system is to be used, you've got to make sure that the specified descent rate, when fully developed, is something that the pilot can live with on contact with the ground, probably literally. Uh, we found after the event, because we hadn't really thought too much about the BRS on the thruster, that the thruster combination would descend under the parachute at 1,200 feet a minute. And... Uh, the thruster seat, if anyone thrown in the seat, is not crashworthy in the slightest. And our engineer, who was an XCA chap, whose name escapes me, uh, opined that if we did that way, we would probably damage our back severely. He said, much better have a, a parachute. But if you had a parachute, you couldn't really take another person as an observer with you. Ensure that the BRS deployment mechanism is easy is in easy sight of the pilots and able to be reached easily, and that the safety pin is removed before each spin. 
or before the whole lot of the spins if you're going to do a few. Uh, that came in because when we did the very first spinning in the Xair, the release position was hidden away underneath the pilot seat, between the two pilot seats, and it wasn't until we did our hazel checks for the first spinning that we realized that the pin was still in easy enough to get out. But if we were in a bit of a panic, we might have not done it quite so easily. <clears throat> Ensure that if the ballistic projectile is to be forced through the side of the aircraft, um, that it will do so. Uh, and it won't just rattle around uselessly inside the, the fuselage. Witness the thruster sprint where we replace the window with, uh, with brown paper. For personal parachute is to be used, make sure that the pilot and the parachute uh, combination permit full uh, and complete stick control. I told you we did the X-Air as the first aircraft. The, main, the importer of that aircraft um, had developed a, a, an X-Air Mark II, and he wanted that to be proven as a, as a 450 um, kilogram aircraft, so he asked us to do it. He flew one of these airplanes from the West Country up to Thrusters Field at Ginge, and left us to get on with it. Um, I found that I couldn't, get, couldn't physically get into the aircraft with a parachute on, even though I took the, the, uh, the doors off and I had to almost uh, take all the cushions. I did have to take all the cushions off the seat. I was able to eventually get in by all sorts of concussions, uh, but when I sat down, there was absolutely no backward movement at all because the parachute was on my back, the seat was not adjustable, and although I tried running up down the runway in the aircraft, couple of times to see if it would bed in. There was no way I was going to get airborne or be able to land it. So I decided not to do it, and uh, a more lithe and slimmer CAA test pilot uh, finished the, the work. The check's in the post. <laughs> Before you go up, practice emergency egress on the ground in slow time. Do it slowly so you can see where the problems are. Uh, do it under supervision as well, if, if you have. To. I've got an engineer with you who's designed the system. He can help you in making sure that you understand what's going on. You should think about this, how to leave the aircraft if you're going out in a parachute um, every time you go into a spin, because it's recommended, and I did a lot of reading on spins and speaking or reading about people who had uh, jumped out of spinning aircraft, and it is far better to leave by the outside part of the spin than on the inside. If you think about it, if you go out of the, if the spinnings this way and you go out this side, you're going to fall with the aircraft and the aircraft's turning into you and you're in danger of falling through or making contact with the arc of the propeller. If it's going round, you'll be in real trouble. If it's not going round, you might snag on it and come down with the aircraft. If you go out on the right-hand side, you're clearing the aircraft and hopefully getting underneath the fuselage as it goes round and over you. That's another good reason for having a hard hat on. You must be able to get to the escape route. Um, doors that hinge forward should be jettisonable. Uh, canopies that are all enclosing should be jettisonable. Or you should be able to ensure if the aircraft is sliding, a sliding canopy, you can get out, out of it that way. It was only necessary to have the, the jettison of it part for the testing that you're doing. Always start out your spin testing if you haven't spun an S aeroplane before with the intention of using the standard spin recovery. If the spin stopped before the full action has been completed, note what the minimum actions are and that will be the recommended uh, procedure for getting out of spins. I, I found that all the, the, the microlites have spun that the Recovery took place the instant you centralized the controls. Once you've got a, an accepted recovery, which may well just be centralizing, throttle off and centralizing controls, um, and if the aircraft doesn't come out, the first thing you should do is hang on to the actions you've done. Don't start wondering what to do next. Hold on because they, they may come out in the next turn. If you get really fed up and uh, you're thinking about getting out, you could go back to the way you got into the spin and start there with the full uh, actions again. But that's my recommendation is to try that way, and if it doesn't come out, get out. Identify an altitude which will trigger your abandonment, and do it. Don't faff around. Don't see 3,000 feet going past you very quickly. Get out of that point. If you wear a flying overall or flying jacket or whatever, 
and make sure it's not baggy so that it won't catch on anything in the cockpit as you're trying to get out the window. Wear footwear that is securely on the feet and will not come off in the shock of opening a parachute. And also, the footwear should be suitable for walking home. That's a good hint anyway, isn't it? As we've said earlier, we, with the dynamic we did, we ran through the emergency procedures on the ground before the start of the program, particularly if you have more than one way of getting out of the aircraft. You should be versed in the techniques to go in the right order. Perform the, spring, the spin program close to the emergency services. In this case, we were going to do it right in front of the noses. That's not always the case in places like UK, where you might have to do a spin test. It's not close to uh, a main airfield, but you must make sure that you're in contact with people on the ground who can know where you are spinning and can come and look for you if you don't come back. So let's have a dedicated radio contact with the appropriate person on the ground. Do not go into a spinning test program unless you have a recent experience in spinning. Now, I used to think it was if I didn't spin within a year or maybe in a year and a half, I would go along to the flying club and get a, an instructor to give me a, a check out on spinning. Do not carry spin testing above cloud cover. If you're above a lot of cloud cover and you spin into a, in the cloud, that's going to be more confusing for you than when you are trying to get the aircraft out. And also be very careful if you spin spinning into a hole in the, the cloud. Make sure it's a big enough one so that you don't suddenly find the red arrows coming the other way. And I suggest that spin testing should always be done over familiar ground because you'll end up doing a lot of spins. Uh, on the thruster day of spinning, we did 76 spin entry attempts and it was quite mind-boggling. Uh, so if we were in a strange place, it might have been more difficult to recognize where the airfield was. Right, um, we have a couple of videos which only last a, a minute or so. Can we see that, John? Uh, the, f the first one, if it's wound up properly, is to be uh, from outside the aeroplane, so you can see it doing one and a half turns spin. So I'm going to switch it on there. And the second one is the same spin from inside. Open mic, I'm afraid. That was a one and a half turn, you saw how quickly it came out. That's all right for that one. Is the cockpit you recognise? It's a very tight throttle. Uh, you see we're at uh, 8,000 feet. Um, nice and simple. That's it. That's the end of my talk, uh, ladies and gentlemen. If anyone has a, any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer them. I'll just say to my colleague here that I haven't started for 40 years. <laughs> well, you'll need a, you'll need a check out. <laughs> uh, question. I mean, I've had the odd thing and what have you, yeah. and strange things happen. But yeah. uh, would you recommend that, say, on the biannual? We... Well, if, if you remember what you're trying to do, you're trying to spin tests, not just spin it. Yeah. You're having to watch things and see things and record things. Familiar with right, yeah. So it's better if you feel comfortable just doing normal spins and then you can concentrate on all the data rather than you need. Yeah. When, you yes, spun, when you spun with the anti spin uh, shoot at the back of the aircraft yeah, yeah, yeah. strapped externally, yeah. that would affect the aerodynamics of the aircraft. Very, very likely. Uh, even that far aft? Uh, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. That very slight. You would spin after you took it off yeah. then? Uh, no, if you'd had to use it to get out of the spin, you'd come back and well, try to work. But once you proved the aircraft would come out of a spin, you didn't retest it without that um, anti... It, it was spun like that without the spin when we got on the UK version. Okay, yeah. Right, yeah, yeah. But remember, it's, it's far back, certainly, but 
You're spinning at very low speeds, just above the stalling speed. Yeah, I know, but if you look at the Tigers, we had to put anti-spin strakes on them, yeah. and they were quite small, sure, sure. but had a terrific difference sure. on the, yeah. the handle. We did, yes, 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 did. Yeah. yes, yes, you're right. <coughs> yes, sorry. I've spun quite a few aeroplanes, and I'll take the Act 52, for example. There are three different techniques of recovery. Yes. One will take four and a half turns, and the quickest way will be one and a half turns. Mm -hmm. Uh, the conventional technique is power off and the object by the stick forward. That would be the four and a half turn version. You mentioned about uh, recovery, um, just sit there and hold it and wait for it to happen. Yeah. Well, after uh, the average person might think after two turns that it's not going to come out. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, four yes. and a half turns yes. it will do. There's quite yes. a lot of yeah, yeah, Yes, it is. But you're spinning airplanes that are approved for spinning. The microlights that we've been spinning are not approved for that. It's only the prototypes that have to show what would happen if you inadvertently get into a spin. And hopefully people are trained so that if they do get into a spin, they take the action immediately. It doesn't always happen. Uh, so you've gone to the required, re what you've determined as the conventional recovery yeah. technique. Did yeah. you not investigate advanced spinning recovery techniques? No, no we didn't. However, well, sorry to interrupt you there. However, there were people who made a case for one microlight type to be cleared for spin training and you'll have to ask a CA uh, or two test pilots who actually did that program. I don't think they approved it in the end. I might add that was four and a half turns of a flat spin. Oh, oh right, right. And uh, just for information of the room, uh, I instructor I had from, uh, he was a World War II instructor, he told me if you get into difficulties in spin, oscillate the power and the elevator sure. uh, could help. Sure. Sure. And from my experience also, uh, in spin aileron and full power sure. will accelerate the recovery from yeah. spin. He's quite right, but you're probably talking about spinning from a very great height. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, because we're talking about spin testing. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. What sort of breakfast do you recommend before 76? <laughs> <laughs> full English, full English. <laughs> <laughs> Makes a lovely mess of the concrete. <laughs> yes. Uh, the dynamic that uh, you showed was 200 carriages on it. And I've, um, I've flown the LSA one uh, in this country. Dynamic? Yeah. There's Charlie with Gecko Mike. It's the micro light version. Uh -huh. got, that hasn't got a still spine on the carriage on it, is it? The only thing to think was a reason why it didn't have to still front. Is it just weight, or is it because they didn't like the undercarriage on it? We, 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 first, we took the first uh, British registered one, not the one that you saw there, but the first one we saw, uh, the, the weight was too, too dodgy, and we actually took off the, uh, the spats. Only were a couple of kilos, but it made all the difference. Yeah. But the, 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 because obviously the one, that's, the one that's approved at the moment is a trailing link undercarriage, isn't it? Yes, it is. Yeah. yeah. And that's lighter than the steel sprung. Is it? That's the only reason. Yeah. Yes. It's um, seven years since I flew it down like that. So it's so obviously changed in, in the new time. Oh, it's interesting why it changed. That's so also it must be weight. Probably weight, yeah. Okay. Yes. You mentioned the um, strakes on leading out of the wing to improve yes. the yeah. over. Yes. I've been building aeroplanes a little bit more, if I dare say, a bit more high performance, the ones you're talking mm -hmm. about. And the way I did it was put half a degree of washout on the wing tip. Yeah, yes. And it made a world of difference. Yes, yes. That's, Absolute world of difference. That's why we tried to do the same thing with adjusting the, ang the, the angle at which the ailerons hung. Yes. I mean, we already had an aeroplane that was yeah, built, so yeah, we could yeah. use fiberglass, we couldn't yeah. change it. Yeah. We're now certifying this particular aeroplane, and the certification authorities have asked us to do a six-turn spin with a dead engine. Ooh. We refused to do it, and now we're the only uh, single-engine aeroplane with a shaker and a pusher. How about that? Mm. Oh. And <laughs> another sense. type of aeroplane, I did the first flight song, your comment, very valid there, about having look see before you start. Mm. Well, it's the V-tail job. And the tails were nearer the vertical than the horizontal. Mm -hmm. And I said, for God's sake, why did we go in for that? I didn't actually design it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, just get the damn things down a little bit because we want them for elevator control. Yes, yes. And the first flight I did, there was just no elevator control on it, period. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
So that um, exemplifies your comment yeah, yeah. about having a look see before yeah, you yeah, start. Yeah. You learn a lot from that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I ventured to say that wasn't the British authority that replied back. Uh, are we going to ask? <laughs> Definitely not. No. Do you know what, who British authority is? Canadian authority. Canadian. It's a rather strange aeroplane. It's a high uh, engined aeroplane. Uh -huh. So you just touch the throttle and it'll immediately come out of a, a spin or a stall. Yeah. Yes. That's why they wanted a dead engine recovery. Yes, yes. Good luck. <laughs> well, we didn't do it, so we've now got a shake and a push. <laughs> Thank you, Tom, for reinforcing so many of the messages that we've been trying to get across during our. Well, you told me what to say. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I was interested, particularly, that you said that you decided not to look at half and three quarter turn spins because only the other day I was reading about the fact that. Because during the initial stages of a spin, there's still quite a lot of forward velocity yes, in the yes. aircraft. Actually, if you recover after a quarter or a half or three quarters of a turn, then the aeroplane is going to recover with a, a, in a, in a perhaps in a worse attitude, in a worse situation than after one one turn. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so, particular care needs to be taken if you do try and recover after. If you try and recover after half a turn, most likely you say it's going to be upside down. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so it may be best to go straight straight from an incipient. So, yes. In straight into a one turn. Yes, program. which is basically what we did. Yeah. 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 Quick yes, no question. I do beg your pardon. Uh, did you do entry from a tight turn, a very tight no. turn, a flick? No. Okay. Not for, not on the dynamic, but we did that on the, the prototypes of the Easy Raider. Mm. I don't know if they did it in, in the Sky Raider because I wasn't part of that part. Because that's a nasty way of getting it. Yes, the people do. People can. And we also had to test it in. Uh, Without shutting the throttle, and uh, that we ended up going almost vertically before we could actually get it to go into a spin. Mm. And we did all of these things to, and with uh, with partial aileron within any aileron, out mm. aileron. It was very thoroughly done. That's why it took 76 all in trend entries to try it. You know. <laughs> it's quite interesting. About 15 years ago, I was one. I think I was the person who recommended to the CAA that they ought to introduce the requirement for spin testing for microlites at the time when the 450kg yes. uh, rule came out. Yeah. Yeah. That was mainly because at that time there were a lot of microlites being developed, especially in Czech Republic, which were kind of, which were pod and boom types with a very slender back end and little tiny swept fins with rudders that were in the wake of the tailplane. And they looked to me to be things that would, could very likely have spin problems. Yes, just by looking at them. Just by looking at them, yes, yeah. So, um, I'm probably to blame for the need for you to do all of this testing, <laughs> but I didn't know whether you felt that it that sort of had been justified, whether you felt well, that indeed, it had. Indeed, yeah, yeah. Uh, Unfortunately, there was uh, an escapade, uh, had a spin from circuit height, and uh, uh, the pilot did not recover. Uh. Um, the AAIB had a good look at it, and they came to see me having done the original spinning on it, but for some reason, he, 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 was, he saw another aircraft, I think, and some unknown reason, pulled the stick back and pulled rudder on and he was into the ground before he knew it. Yes? Do you recommend spin training for your, your average pilot? I'm a glider pilot. Yeah, 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 yeah. We, we spin very regularly. Well, I always find that there's no average pilot, they're all above average, don't you think? <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 regretted, I regretted that uh, the PPL um, syllabus uh, did not do uh, spin test training. I've flown with quite a lot of power pilots who've come to gliding and spinning. Yeah. And they're very wary of spinning. Yes, yes, afraid of it. Yeah, yeah. So as soon as you've done yeah. a bit of it in gliders, then yeah. it's straightforward. So if yeah. anybody wants to spin, go and visit your local gliding club. <laughs> well, when I did my PPL on Tiger Moth, it was part of the solo syllabus was to spin the aircraft. Well, initial, initial spinning is one and a half turns, not preferential over to one turn because the nose is typically one lower yeah. after one, one, one turn. One turn and then you recover? Yeah, one turn. Yeah. Remember, this is just meeting a requirement. It's not making the aircraft a spinnable aeroplane. Uh -huh. uh, more likely to recover if the nose is lower, which is typical, in my experience, of a one and a half turn spin. You're not part of the CA, are you? Have a word with that. <laughs> 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 you didn't say very much about the, the um, sort of bag of the fabric covered um, mm -hmm. really? deeper level microlites like the thruster and the port PX there. Did you find they had any surprises over there? That's been happening. 
I think yeah. the XA have a very, very slow rate. Well, it was the very first one we did, and we were just looking to see if we could recognise the actual spin rather than going into a, uh, what do you call it, a, a, a diving a dive. yeah, turn. Uh, I, I don't recall. It's a long time since so we did it, yeah. if that was the case. And do, do, you, do you find it's a problem, or have you found it's a pro problem that um, during the spin recovery in an aeroplane that's very much non-aerobatic and limited to a 4G um, mm. manoeuvre limit, um, can it be difficult to recover the aircraft within the allowable flight envelope? We never found it to be so. In fact, I always found it difficult to get uh, to meet the CA uh, the um, requirements for pulling out of, uh, of dives and things to getting up above 2G. It was often very difficult to get above 2G in a microlight. Right. Well, Good. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.